Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A6 and Z podcast. I'm Sonal. Today's episode is continuing our new medium storytelling series. This episode in particular is focusing on virtual worlds and more broadly, filmmaking techniques and the evolution of narrative. Joining this conversation, we have two-time Academy Award winner Robert Stromberg. He won Oscars for production design on Avatar and Alice in Wonderland. He was also the director of Disney's Maleficent, and he directed the Martian VR Experience, which received the Cannes Silver Lion Award. Also joining this conversation are Deal and Investing Team partner Kyle Russell and editorial partner Hannah Tidnam. But we began the conversation with Robert telling us about his career, which went from being a mat artist to visual effects to art direction to production, directing, and now co-founder of The Virtual Reality Company, a studio for this new era. So we're really excited to have you. And I think what's really especially unique about your background is, A, the immense variety of things and the range of things that you've done, but also because you bring such a unique perspective that sort of stitches it all together from starting with your own career, which maybe we should start off as sort of your background and how you sort of got here. Yeah. It's, it's been um, an extremely interesting ride. I seem to change careers about every five years, it seems. But I started off, my father was a low-budget filmmaker, and I grew up watching my dad make um, monster films in our garage. He was a big fan of Ray Harryhausen and Willis O'Brien. And um, so I was, you know, uh, immediately struck with the fascination of, of not just film, but the world creation. And it was like magic to me at the time. Yeah. Um, that led me into sort of creating the, the backgrounds for some of the stuff he was doing. And that led to an 18-year career as a, a mat artist and visual effects supervisor, which uh, took me to a point where um, I met a director named Peter Weir, and we did uh, a film called Master and Commander together. And he's a great man, a gentleman. But, you know, we became such close friends that at, by the time we were finished, he felt like I had designed so much in the movie that he gave me the credit um, on the film as um, visual effects designer. Uh -huh. And um, it was really interesting because um, I hadn't really started off to be a production designer. I actually wanted to be a director uh, even as a kid. But um, hard to break into. It, it is. And, you know, um, I got a call one day from from Jim Cameron, you know, who calls. Wait, said, but Jim Cameron, you mean the James Cameron? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. James You're Cameron. Like, Jim, <laughs> my buddy, Jim you know, Cameron. My buddy Jim. No. Of Titanic yeah, fame oh, and blah, blah, blah. But it was, it was so out of the blue. It was a Sunday. And, you know, the phone rang and it says, uh, hey, it's James Cameron. And I said, yeah, right, okay, sure, <laughs> whatever. Who's playing and, a joke on you? But but he 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 asked me um, if because he had seen Master and Commander and he just loved the 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 realistic qualities and the design of it all. He felt that it was very real and gritty, and so he he asked me, um, you know, would I be willing to help him for a few days uh, to because he had a studio presentation. I said, okay, sure, and. Uh, I said, can you tell me a little about it? And he said, yeah, it's a big science fiction film, takes place on another planet, you know, and very vague, really. <laughs> oh, and, no. Uh, what, what movie was he talking about? You have to tell us. What do we think it is? It's <laughs> Avatar. <laughs> I said, can you tell me any more about it? And he said, well, when we get together, we will. But um, all I can tell you is that it's on a moon that's orbiting a big gas planet. And, that's literally uh, all he told you about. Avatar. And he said, he said, "There's floating mountains. Floating mm. mountains is on a moon, and that's basically that's all he what said. he knew." Yeah, can oh you come God. see me tomorrow? And I said, "Okay." <laughs> so, well, James Cameron, floating mountains, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I had never met him, but um, I was so inspired by the call, and I'd spent years doing my own artwork. So I did. Uh, I said, "What the what the heck? I'll I'll do something." So I just made up this image of uh, Vista, you know, and it had giant trees and floating mountains and. and um, just based off the very little information yeah, you had. Yeah, just, just being inspired. I just yeah. decided to do And sorry, something. when you say you made up, did you make it up in like some digital form? Was it on paper with the mock-up? Like, no, it was, what a, was it? it was a, a visual image, a Photoshop, mm -hmm. Photoshopped image. It started off as a sketch and then into Photoshop. But um, I said, what the heck? So uh, I went into to um, meet Jim the next morning, he and John Landau, the producer. And we were talking for some time and we all agreed what we could do. Okay, good. And then I said, hey, you know, Jim, I did this piece of art. I, you know, you want to see it? And, and he said, sure. And I put it up on the screen and he literally sort of turned white and, oh my God. and pounded his fist into the table 
And I said, what the heck have I done? <laughs> and he pointed at it and he, he just looked at it and he said, that's my movie. Oh my God, that's and, amazing. And that four days or whatever was going to be turned into four and a half years. Mm-hmm. And, Working and on Avatar, yeah. that's how long it took. Yeah, and, and as a production designer... So yeah. my, it was my very first production design. What did that thing. entail roughly? We're not familiar with the industry. So production design includes everything from? Oh, uh, every plant, every everything about the, the, the world of Pandora. You're creating that world from scratch? Yeah, every single uh, element of it. It must um, feel like being like God almost to be uh, creating from plants to it's, mountains. It's very spiritual, you know, I have to say. I mean, um, it, it, it it's a, a, a sort of nod to... How I feel about creation in general. Um, it's a, sort of an honor to be able to do that stuff. How I just much want to free reign did you have? I mean, was complete. It total, you know, it was really totally just, your vision. It was really just Jim and I in the beginning. Later on, um, a guy by the name of Rick Carter came on, who was a week co-production design. He did the human elements, the military base, mm-hmm. and and I did the organic world. Let's talk about some of your directing work. And so you directed Maleficent, which, by the way, is such an amazing movie because I love the fact that you tell the story of the dark queen that people have always wondered. It's a different wondered. perspective, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and I think that's what was compelling to me. And I, I think if, if we had just told a straight out of the box version of Sleeping Beauty, people wouldn't have been as engaged. I think it, the, the unique part about the film was that we got to see a different point of view and see some things that we might have wondered about if we had seen Sleeping Beauty. So to me, that was really, uh, really interesting. What was some of the adjustment in making the shift in um, doing, say, production um, art and design design to the directing? I mean, beyond like the scope of what you're doing. It's it's kind of interesting. I was doing a a panel in Oslo, Norway, and s- someone in the audience asked me what makes somebody an artist and, mm-hmm. and another person not. And, That's a great question, actually. And, you know, I thought about it for a long time because it is a great question. And um, what I came to was that I believe that creative types or artist types are better observers of the world or more curious somehow about the world itself. And what happens is by paying attention to all those small little details Mm -hmm. that nobody else cares about, those are the elements that allow you to complete a problem. Uh, You know, if you look at art as a series of questions and answers that you ask yourself to get to the finish line, if you know those little subtle answers, you're able to get there. I once heard John Maida um, say that he that the distinction between design and art, on a different note, is that design answers questions and art asks questions. That was kind of an interesting yeah. way of sort of thinking about it. So one question um, we have is that so you have this incredible, rich background and in, in so many ranges of filmmaking. And now when you think about this fact that you created entire worlds, like from down to the plants in an avatar, how does that sort of translate to VR where it seems it's almost like unmooring? There's no place to necessarily anchor yourself almost. Oh, I, I thought the I thought it was ex- extremely exciting. You know, I mean, what we were doing, uh, I'm not saying that that avatar created VR. What I'm mm-hmm. saying is that for the first time, we were felt like we were pioneering and, and entering into something new. Wait, a, why is that? Well, the first time, because it was the first time we were making a movie in a 360 degree world with oh. a virtual camera. The only thing different is that the camera wasn't attached to your or, um, a headset. So what you're describing was for the camera setup with Avatar. Basically, there was a pre-made virtual world of what Pandora looked like, mm-hmm. and actors were in front of large green screens and. While filming, you'd look through a screen on the camera that would show you what that person looked like in the context of the virtual world. Is that correct? Partly. So actually, the entire movie, there was a section of the movie that was shot in New Zealand, which were actual sets Uh and actual actors. But the majority of the film was actually all motion capture, which means that uh, all the actors had um, a motion capture suit on. And it was we were in a warehouse in Playa del Rey, and it was just a big gray huge building with uh, infrared cameras everywhere. And we had terrain simulations on the ground so that when the actors went up and down and over logs and things... They would feel like they were, yeah. Yeah, and we just replaced that with the digital stuff. Mm -hmm. The camera itself was completely virtual. Mm -hmm. In other words, you were looking at a screen, but Jim had the ability to, you know, change that into any lens, any 
uh, scale of movements. So you could have a techno crane move or just a little bitty move, um, all w- with the same tool. The ability to to use any lens or um, any camera movement. It could, if you just move your hand three inches, could be a hundred mm-hmm. foot move, mm-hmm. or it could be a three inch move. So wow. the ability to scale and to move around was unbelievable, and that was just to record the the um, the the actors and, and we were seeing back real time the uh, the actors as their avatar characters right and it, but it was it wasn't in full fidelity right it was kind of a lower no. quality rendering yeah I used to call it the crayon version ultimately what the film would look oh, like oh okay right um, obviously when we first started Avatar I remember the the first meeting. Uh, where we saw the test of motion capture and the capabilities. The first test was just one figure hopping over a little gray log, and Jim said, okay, we can do this, right? But by the time we were finished, technology had advanced so rapidly that we suddenly were making the movie in a fully uh, detailed world. I mean, it was sort of what we, in sort of a pre viz state. It was like video game level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, full fidelity. But everything that we did on that stage went to the visual effects people who just upgraded that to higher res models and all that stuff. So you had a very early sense of what it would be like to create a kind of virtual reality world and film. But when was the first time you you felt what it would be like to consume it, to experience it on the other end? Well, even then, at the end of Avatar, I was thinking, geez, it's just a matter of time before... Um, we are able to create a viewing system where we'll fe- be able to sort of walk around Pandora, you know, and actually go there. And Pandora being the world the, of the Avatar. The world of Avatar, right. yeah. And, but, it, you know, at the time the movie came out, um, the tech wasn't there for the headsets and all that for VR. But I did want to keep my eye on what was happening. And I went off to do other things. I just, um, designed Alice in Wonderland right mm-hmm. after that. And then... Um, Oz the Great and Powerful after that. Do you I mean, remember the first time you put on, you know, that you actually yeah, experienced um, it? So, so one day woke up, I was during the middle of Maleficent and, um, and read that Facebook had bought, you know, a company called Oculus. Which for by the way is an investment of ours, just to say full disclosure. <laughs> so that very day I read it, I got up and I actually cold called Oculus. Um, they were still just a small group in Irvine at the time and asked if I could come see what they were doing. And they, they, you know, cordially said yes. And so I immediately went down there and they invited me into their little secret room. And, (laughs) um, and that very day, what I saw was exactly what I hoped I would see. And that is that finally, you know, we have a viewing system that uh, would allow us to, to step into these worlds that I've always dreamed about. And it sort of, shocked me in a in a very big way and so I, on that same day I walked down to the cafe of that of their building and called my two other friends and said we're starting a company today mm. and that Which, was for the virtual reality company VRC fantastic yeah. branding by the way well <laughs> owning that right from the beginning well that tells you how long ago it was <laughs> <laughs> you know I have a question for you on the on the technology and the creative sort of the balance because one of the things that I know a lot of people complain about for better or worse about George Lucas and some of the newer Star Wars movies is how at the end of the day those movies kind of became unmoored because it was just him playing with a lot of toys and CGI and kind of losing sight of like the narrative mm-hmm. and the plot and a lot of people feel like Rogue One for example sort of addressed some of those wrongs and they were sort of proud that Disney took that on in a way and one of the questions I have is when you describe the ability to create a world from scratch and having come at it from filmmaking and now going into VR how do you sort of keep everything sort of not unmoored? Because one of the things that I see with a lot of early VR art, it, it has almost an overly fantastical quality to mm. it, overly video game-like. And and it doesn't feel, and I know, Kyle, you've argued in the podcast in the past that you don't have to feel fully real. Just a figure that's sort of rough can even convey the same thing. How do you navigate this, not letting the technology unmoor the creative or vice versa? Well, I think very much like Avatar. I look at things not today, but you know, five years from now. Ideas will always be ideas that are catching up and the, the tech is catching up. With They're, they're constantly it's in a sprint together. Yeah, it's like, it's like they reinforce each other. Yeah, they're not so, linear. So I think that, um, you know, the fidelity will get better. The, the viewing systems will get better. And one day you'll be, you'll be able to go into the worlds of Pandora, wherever you want to go, but in a very, very real way. You know, right now, you know, we when we're running at 90 frames a second and... Um, the, the, um, and through game engines and things like that, that there's a tremendous amount of 
material and information happening. And we all know that that stuff will get better over time. You know, a lot of these movies that you've done and worked on have this archetypal story feel to them, the fairy tale or even Avatar sort of a Jungian, you know, (laughs) archetypal story. What are there genres or types of stories that you think you'll do a better job of telling with VR that they'll open up a different kind of way of talking about or telling stories? I do. And I was I was just on the phone this morning with somebody talking about this because, you know, um, in the, when I was doing didn't, not directing, but when I was doing visual effects, I would work on all types of movies, and and each one of them is singing, if you will, different songs. So for instance, when I was a visual effects supervisor and I was doing a film like Walk the Line, Mm -hmm. no one knew there were visual effects in it. Wait, Walk the Line is in the Johnny Cash story. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize you did that. I did lots of movies where you didn't know there were visual effects in them. Um, But what you get known for is the fingerprint and that's the the fantasy stuff. So in in VR, what we haven't seen yet is, and what I'm trying to do with, with VRC is to bring the gaming world and Hollywood together in a way that hasn't been seen before. And, I was going to say, that's one of the things I found most impressive about uh, The Martian. If uh, the virtual reality company is famous for anything today, it's the first production that you did with Fox Innovation Labs, which is The Martian, uh, basically letting you be Matt Damon stuck on Mars for a couple minutes. Sciencing the shit out of everything. Yeah, (laughs) and and it's beautiful. (laughs) So many conversations we have with people in Hollywood and kind of more traditional film mindset is the idea that, oh, well, VR is this big, tricky puzzle to deal with because we don't have editing and quick cuts and camera movements don't work the same way. And so it's all these disadvantages, how it's always framed. Mm-hmm. But when I played through The Martian, you, know, you were taking advantage of the very latest capabilities of the headsets out there on the HTC Vive that you were using positional tracking, hand tracking, where right. my moving around on the Mars surface, it was the exact same motion of my body and hands in my living room. Right. And uh, it's not so much that you weren't able to You weren't able to cut to other significant events happening in a specifically timed way, but I got to spend time actually there. And what's the game like about it is the fact that uh, the story, it's not controlled entirely by the filmmakers. It's you have to have some kind of input on the world for the plot to move forward. And so choose your own adventure. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so I'm curious, are there other kind of limitations that people talk about when it comes to film that you think actually that's not a weakness? It lets us experiment in these other ways. We entered into that and like we entered into um, Avatar, which is really, can we do this at all? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is this is this is long before any of the hand controllers were available and all of that stuff. So we were working with literally like soldered together hand controller prototypes and things. And. But rather than having like floating hands like we all see in VR, we actually came up with a way to, you know, do the IK for And that's the inverse actual, kinematics. So working out yeah. from the movement of your hands, what your arms and elbows and every other joint's that's right. doing. Because when you see Wait, why is that such a hard problem? Because there's just so much uh, you know, so much happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and and by the way, you know, this is taking the you know, the Vive and and Oculus and their equipment and adapting to what we need it to do as well. So you're kind of customizing the hardware too. It's like the early days of computing. One of the biggest hurdles of even that uh, that the, the Martian was was developing the, the arms, mm-hmm. you know, which are completely textured. So you could put your arm right up to your, close to your face and, right, see, and see the same controls that, that, that Matt a, Damon had in the movie that's on his right. arm. And you're in a spacesuit. So, you know, if you don't have that, you don't have a complete sense of immersion in what's happening. So, um, so that was incredibly important. And I think, you know, groundbreaking in many ways. That's on the technical aspects on the narrative side. Did the people who played the Martian, assuming they hadn't seen the movie and they don't know the narrative, how do they sort of know how to direct themselves in the environment? Because this is the question I constantly well, have about VR. I was talking to Ridley along the way, um, and he was kind enough to let us work uh, while he was in editorial still on making the actual film. But he allowed us to take their footage and experiment with it. So I came up with this this thing I called box cutters, which is basically floating windows that come up and, and, and down like an edit 
at it. So fascinating. It, 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 it propelled. You're still in VR, and f- things feel dimensional, but it's still preparing, uh, propelling the the narrative forward. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting ways that people have a sort of find. It doesn't have to be linear necessarily, obviously, but it, it's interesting how people are finding these ways of almost providing a weird sort of skeuomorphism for VR, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, some other narrative experiments I've seen, they've got done away with putting sci-fi floating text in front of you, instead have what looks like a physical road sign, like yeah. with a giant arrow saying "Go." here next. Speaking of gaming, there's a game um, that I played. Um, I don't play that many games, but it was a game called Extra Solar, which was all like exploring mm-hmm. Mars and super high def. And it was very scientific and you were on this mission to find it, but you had no, I, I abandoned it after a while because I had no idea what to do next. And that was a game, not a VR immersive environment. I mean, the, the rule book is still not been written on, on how to make you know, narrative storytelling in VR. I like to sort of look at it a little bit like, you know, a Broadway play, for instance, you know, where you, there's a director and actors in front of you that are conveying a story to you. And you can sit in any seat in the theater and and still be told the same story. Now, if you were to jump up on stage and get in the middle of all of that, you would feel as though you were intruding. There's a lot of psychological elements yeah. that go along mm-hmm. with, you know, creating storytelling in, in VR. And, and not that, to mention other cues like oral cues and sure. and all the other things as well. Well, it's like real life. I'm I'm looking yeah. at you guys and when you talk I look at you and when yeah. you talk I look yeah. So it it's it's not just um, audio cues, it's visual cues. It's um, I the, you, you can edit, by the way. You just have to do it in clever ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done a lot of um, research in, um, you know, motion because obviously, if you if you if you artificially give somebody a sense of motion, they can um, not feel well. So I spent a lot of time figuring that out. And one of the things I figured out is, you know, keeping the horizon um, correct and at all oh, times. Fascinating. Because our equilibrium is so delicate yeah. that uh, that if you're off a little bit, you feel it. You know, and also it's very important when you're when you're moving the camera that you you're moving um, really really smooth in a in a path constant forward. motion no acceleration yeah let on a rail right. let let the people do the looking because mm-hmm. when you take that ability away from them they they feel that as well you know i i think that that eventually we'll probably see some sort of motion rating system so you mean like content rating well, like well, gpg and well, like for, motion well rating. but for motion so like uh-huh. if we had this sort of like a color base that orange blue green oh uh, you know, the the orange level is for kids and the, yeah. so on and so on. Something I think isn't communicated well enough today is the fact that nausea typically, it's not the hardware itself. Oh, if you use this gadget, you're going to get sick from VR. It's experiences built in a certain way, using acceleration in a certain way, moving the camera in a certain way. That's, That's right. what leads to it. And it's something that you can label and highlight and say, hey, this experience tends to do things in a way that to a subset of people might mm-hmm. make you feel a little uneasy. So if you uneasy. don't like right. roller coasters, don't watch that. Right. 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 Well, it's enormously well, what's, what's about your own inner but, ear too. Totally unique to the individual. But I think you could say like this, to this ex- to the extent that you are susceptible to it, this right. experience would contribute to those right. things or these w- this Right. Wouldn't. If you're someone like me who gets seasick on a rowboat, right. you'll pro- you may but that, get that's a different kind of motion. That's right. a constant up and down motion where the horizon is changing. If you're on a roller coaster, you're on a smooth rail and you are you have the option to look around so that's where the horizon yeah. becomes so important. so fascinating oh. I love that you mentioned uh, the pl- the theater experience too because something that struck me about VR is that in a way it's like almost like going back to reading and being so psychologically immersive right mm-hmm. and it's almost removing the 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 screen when that you know that put it's us screenless. out of the yeah like the chapter wasn't really a standardized function of the novel until the Bible like the point of view wasn't a common thing until Eisenstein, the Russian filmmaker. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tools that you're starting to get inklings? This is actually going to open up a different opportunity for us rather than just problem solving to make sure that we that are, that we don't get sick you know that the right. horizon stays the same that, that, that feels existing. like it allows us a new kind of access to emotional right so you know, that doesn't reference existing yes yeah, so that does you know, I think what, we, what you're going to see in vr is um there's going to be m- more choices of of what experience you want i mean there will be um the possibility for you to part- participate in a film and um, there'll, there'll be other times where you want 
something to unfold, unfold in front of you and just take it in and let somebody mm-hmm. tell you a story. I, mean, I have the choice right now to go to a movie theater, sit back in the dark and let somebody tell me a story. Or I could go home and turn on the Xbox and uh, control my own moves. So or, screenwriters now are going to have to write 500 stories of one movie <laughs> for... Well, I don't know. It's actually really interesting because VR is, is um, it, it's literally a brand new... Uh, medium. I mean, and it's still in infancy, if you will. Right now, it's been introduced mainly in the gaming world. But um, part of the important part is to to find that first, you know, uh, narrative storytelling event in VR that is so compelling and like emotional, the killer story. Yeah, app with almost. real actors and yeah. and some and makes you feel something. And and once that happens, um, I think a flood floodgate of um, other storytellers will get involved. And when I first saw the movie Gravity, for instance, oh, I thought, God, oh, I love that movie. Yeah, I, w- I, I said, oh, man, that's make a great VR film. You have these super long moves. You're mm-hmm. floating. Um, it's emotional. 85% of that movie was CG anyways. Gravity is an interesting example to me because I actually saw it in two forms. I saw it in its regular movie, like the flat version. And then I saw it in the 3D, mm-hmm. which I know is not VR just for the sake of terminology and clarification. But I found the 3D version to be more distracting because while there was a very immersive, tangible, tactical quality to it, it was very distracting from the actual emotional experience. Whereas the first time I saw it without the 3D, I was in completely emotionally immersed because I was just so lost mm-hmm. in this story of a woman trapped in space and in her own life, essentially. Avatar was in 2D and 3D. You know, the majority of the people I talked to found the 3D version, you know, compelling and emotional. So I think it is an argument for mm-hmm. for both. both. But um, look, it's always going to boil down to storytelling, uh, writing, uh, compelling um, storylines and and really interesting characters. And in VR, you know, I, I hate, hate to say this, but I feel like we're at this sort of parlor trick stage of things right now. Unfortunately, it's a bunch of little proof of concepts of, oh, we actually can guide your attention from one side of your body right. to the other without needing to necessarily control where the camera's pointed. How do we keep your attention but still give you the freedom of feeling like you have agency and you can look at whatever it's like you want. Writing little poems instead of a novel. Right. Um, well, we haven't seen Meryl Streep in VR yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> just, for our, just for our listeners, this was recorded the day after the Golden Globes. <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm I go back far enough where I witnessed analog to digital, right? right. In the first place, where computers were these things no one knew about and um what was interesting is in the early days of computer graphics, um, it was the, the the people that built the equipment themselves that were making stuff. And um, and I remember a spe- very specific time where when when the creatives of Hollywood and visual effects and all of those people joined forces with those technical people, mm-hmm. and and that's when it, it all of a sudden you saw an explosion of really good. Um, you know, visual effects, CG work. Mm-hmm. Is that what you think this is the shift of an entire medium like to HD or more like how 3D was? Where well, the reason became- I say that is because creative people in general, once they join forces with the, 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 the smart minds and the technical people behind all of the new technology, then we'll start to see That's it really soon. So in this yeah. shift, we're talking about the handset and the hardware makers. We're talking about the studios and we're talking about the content and the creators. We're talking about the filmmakers, old and new. And in between, there's all these different players. There's distribution and there's platforms. So we have this whole ecosystem. Where do you fit? Well, from day one, um, I, I, I knew that there was going to have to be a symbiotic relationship between the technical and the creative. And so from day one, um, my intent was to be a pioneer in the content of VR and not uh, an innovator in any new sort of, you know, um, hardware. So something I'd love to touch on is kind of the intersection of your art and the business of it. As a creator and someone wanting to take advantage of the capabilities of the underlying platforms, because with VR today, you know, there's kind of the high tier where, again, as with The Martian, you've got your head and hand tracking that lets you be this other person. Mm -hmm. Whereas on mobile, it can, it uses the same sensors that are in your phone for checking whether you turned it to the side so that it should play video horizontally uh, to 
detect rotation of your head. And so it's kind of this right. fishbowl of video around you. Um, the thing is, is, because it's so much cheaper, it's something like 5x more devices have been sold than on the high end things attached to a PC. Sure. So how do you think about kind of the tug of I want to reach a bunch of people and the tug of I want to make the coolest things possible with VR today? The high end. Well, again, I think we're in the the infancy stages of things. I mean, you know, you can you can you can play a two D game and be compelled on your iPhone, or you can go home and turn on your Xbox. It depends on you know a decision that you make and what sort of fidelity and you know um, interaction you want. But what we're trying to do, and it's in these early days, is be platform agnostic and and pay attention to all platforms. It's looking ahead three years from now, right. you know, and what's going to happen and planning now for when. Uh, the market is there when people adopt to a certain platform. So uh, right now, um, a lot of what I do is is thinking about the future and more, where the technology is going, and try and match um, a, a marketing plan and a business plan that that will meet that um, you know at that junction. How do you think that people are going to access the content? Who's uh, going to pay to? Yeah. Do you yeah Do you think that it's something along the lines of Netflix or HBO where you kind of pay for this all access bucket? Is it something where you basically pay for a session? You get to spend 20 minutes in Avatar for $10? The business model will change. I think, you know, over time when there's enough content and there's enough library to, to, to you know, um, you know um, to sustain a subscription base. Right. When people know. talk about, oh, what's Netflix sure. for VR and, look like, and, they and forget the way, that there were decades of backlog of film content that that's Netflix right. could tap into. That's in fact, right. some people and, complain that Netflix is now changing that whole nature, how people interact with those archives, because it's such a limited subset. Yeah. Initially, where you you know, um, when you have sites like Steam and, you you know, Oculus site and all these, these will be the first places that you're able to sort of download. But I can see very clearly uh, a time when you will have this sort of Netflix like library to choose from and pay for a subscription. So given the rate of adoption of these VR uh, headsets, you know, several hundred thousand units each for the Rift and Vive, let's say, um, does the idea of having some other form of getting to people sound like, are you interested, for instance, in the uh, like arcade model of set up places at a movie theater where you go see Star Wars Episode 8 and here is a Star Wars tie-in VR experience or here mm-hmm. is um, Ready Player One, here's a Ready Player One VR experience. Oh, there's, there's lots of talk of that and we're talking to people about that. And I think you could very realistically see, um, you know, 30, 40 seat theaters right. pop up with um, with seats that, motion-based seats that are synchronized to the experience itself. So there, there, you'll have that option or you can go home and perhaps everyone will have um their VR set up at home uh, in, in you know very sim- similar model. Uh, right now it's uh, so early, and um, you're right that 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 mobile is what where we're really focused on right now. But that's going to change over time as as people. I'll tell you what the key is: is when there's more compelling content, there's mm. c- there's content that people are willing to buy. It'll happen. It's a difficult tautology to deal with because it's when the the things are there that you would buy, people will buy it. You have to have television shows if you buy a TV, you know. So so um, and and that's that's where we're at now. I think this next year is very exciting because a lot of attention will focus on on better, compelling content. So what are some of the things just to wrap up that you are um, excited about and that you're thinking about next? Well, we just we just completed uh, an 18 minute piece with Steven Spielberg, um, who, who, you know, I'm surprised uh, you didn't call him Stevie. (laughs) Stevie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Really quick story is, is that when I first started, um, VRC, one of the first things I wanted to do was prove that it could be a cinematic tool and Mm -hmm. not just a, a a gaming tool. So I did a four minute test that I called there, which is basically a little girl taking you through this dreamlike, um, landscape. And, um, and I ended up showing that to Stephen, and um, it was, um, I just remember the look on his face. It changed everything in his view wow. of VR. And so I was at his house. He was inviting all his grandkids and everybody else <laughs> to watch. And it was just a really moving, moving moment. And what it proved to me is that you can 
do something, um, you know, in storytelling um, that's emotional and compelling. Mm-hmm. And where we're going now is we are doing branching narratives, so mm-hmm. which is really cool. That you choose your own adventure. Yeah. So you can be going through a story being told to you and depending on where you look, take different paths and different stories. Mm-hmm. So it, the, 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 the idea of rewatching it again is is there and talk about Alice in Wonderland. It's like, yeah. drink me. <laughs> but the next generation of gaming platform or storytelling is the same as the first, uh, computer game, uh, or game narrative format. You know, mm. uh, you've entered a room, go through the door. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's yeah. just that, uh, with much more impressive visuals. I'm just so interested in the, how you write that kind of choice into the story. It will have to be a story that has a kind of multiplicity to it. Adding free will into it, that's the hard part. To figure out where that fits into narrative. The writing challenge Uh around that to make it not, like Kyla saying, choose one door. Well, it is Alice in Wonderland, but look, we we can read a book and we can adapt that to a screenplay and Mm -hmm. we can do certain things. I think we can follow character paths, character arcs, and, and write a story to each of those arcs. Um, which all ties together at the end with one broad narrative. Well, it actually does go back to the early days of filmmaking and the idea that you couldn't translate plays to movies and movies now to VR. There's going to be a lot of a new language Mm -hmm. and a storytelling uh, medium being created, but yet sometimes using some of the same fundamental core principles about what makes people emotionally Well, I just love this idea that we can have multiple stories at once and not necessarily have... It one have more weight or more authority. I heard of the truth version. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of social as- aspects to to VR as well, and how that could change the way we socialize together. In fact, Kyle, you argued in one of the blog posts last year um, that actually social and Kevin Kelly argued this on our podcast too that VR would actually be one of the more counterintuitively social platforms as opposed not to not an isolating out the rest one. of your friends mm-hmm. right which is I think true of any competing platform in the end yeah, we're all staring at our phones but it's to see what our friends are up to somewhere else so I mean all that'll change yeah. I mean there's so many tentacles in VR it's not um, a sort of one trick pony I think you'll see successes in in certain areas yeah. and and failures and others. But, you know, for me, this next year is is going to be really focused on proving that you can tell an emotional tale, have a com- have it compelling enough for people to sort of engage and, and, and want to sort of um, see more of. And sustain it, right? A longer one, not just four minutes in a yeah. dream world. Yes. Yeah. We've already started what I will call a feature length mm-hmm. VR film. And I'm also thinking of reinventing the intermission. So I love this yeah. when these details about the format, you know, yeah. these little like the chapter, like the intermission. Can you talk about that? What would that mean? Well, I mean, we used to watch films that were very long and they would have yeah. an intermission in the middle. By the way, Indian like, movies still have intermissions and then Bollywood movies, they still have intermissions. When you go to a, a, a stage play, there's an intermission. Mission. Especially in VR, I think we want to be able to sort of give the viewer the mm-hmm. option to take a break and um, at, at Bring least back in these the early stage, stages of where we're at and give, you know, you can, can take you some can, Dramamine maybe. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. Yeah. He's like, if I'm doing my job well, damn yeah, it, no. You well, only, if you, only if you're watching VR on a boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so bring back the intermission. That's super exciting and yeah. interesting. I also like the narrative tool that the intermission was, you know, at mm-hmm. one particular it divides it into two, a before and after. And yeah. there's a take pause. Take a sec, digest. And where are we when we come back? You know, it was part of the story architecture. It was also. actually where it, the climax right. peaked and where the denouement kind of started. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. like the old serials. You would sort of end on a point, made people talk and come back into it. You right. Know. Mm-hmm. TV before we got the binge culture from Netflix. Which is well, also yeah. another interesting you know, the, way of reinventing well, a medium, well, reinventing the, the intermiss- a story. Yeah, but yeah. Inter- intermissions in television are commercial, so. so. That actually does open up interesting questions for advertising as well. So everything from bringing back the intermission to ratings, and we could keep talking for hours, but this is just fascinating. Thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being on the A6 and Z podcast. Well, thank you for having me.